You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. Welcome along to the Straight to Video Podcast. Hope everyone is doing great out there. Now, I am super happy to have the brilliant Mike Tully on today's show. Mike's podcast, The Tully Show, has been one of my favorite podcasts for some time now. So I reached out to him to see if he'd be up for having a talk. And I was stoked that he agreed. Mike's music knowledge throughout his show was what hooked me in. And occasionally when he would get Mark McGrath from Sugar Ray as a co-host on numerous episodes... They would constantly be dipping into chat about the Sunset Strip hard rock scene and not in a fun making way either but showing a real love of the genre so it was great to talk all about Mike's introduction to all of that. What was really interesting though when putting together some questions for our chat was unlocking what a crazy journey Mike has been on even from his early childhood which to be honest I wasn't expecting to learn about. There is so much to talk about and Mike is a killer storyteller so unfortunately we didn't get to cover it all as much as I would have liked but we did chat a lot about his early years travelling from New Jersey to New York City for school, his adventures in trying to make it in a rock band during the 1990s, even I think to even Mike's surprise he landed a place at Oxford University here in the UK and then on his return headed out west to start his radio career with Sirius XM where he would team up with professional skateboarder, MMA fighter and now radio personality Jason Ellis. The two of them even ended up playing in a couple of bands together but more recently it's been a crazy few months for both Mike and Jason as suddenly at the end of 2020 their whole team discovered that their long running and hugely popular show on Sirius was being cancelled and they were pretty much instantly out the door. Now whilst in the past that may have been something of a death curse but in today's world it has allowed the Jason Ellis team to bounce back and bring their loyal listener base over to what is already a massively successful new podcast format of the show and Mike has also launched his own Patreon page along with a separate podcast called Tully Time to run alongside the Tully Show and is serving up a whole host of great content over there. Man, I really wish we could have spoke a little longer as we only really touched on a few of the subjects, but this is a great fun chat, which I hope you guys will enjoy and hopefully check out what Mike does. For more info, you can find both The Tully Show, which I highly recommend, and also The Jason Ellis Show on your favourite podcast platforms. And you can also watch The Jason Ellis Show on YouTube. Mike is also on Twitter, simply at Tully, or on Instagram at Tullywood. Or check out his Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Mike Tully. But right now, please strap in and enjoy my straight to video chat with the brilliant Mike Tully. Congrats on hitting the ground running with the revamped Jason Ellis show and the Patreon and all that kind of thing. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really different world that we live in now. It used to be that, you know, you would, there would be, I like, I I remember TV shows when I was a kid. I used to like get a life with Chris Elliott, you know, I don't know if that name or that show or that name means anything to you, but it was like this weird offbeat thing that not too many people knew about. And my experience, especially as someone who's always been into sort of offbeat entertainment was that you would like something or even a band or whatever. And then it would just be gone. And you would just be like, oh, I really enjoyed that thing. I wonder whatever became of any of it. So I'm kind of a, uh, like a, um, some people call it like a pessimistic way of looking at things, but I'm just sort of like a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Like I'm very, very excited about what is possible in the future, but at least like right here, right now, I'm sincerely so grateful that it wasn't just like on November 19th or whatever it was. We did a radio show and then on November 21st, we just disappeared and 
to the mist. You know, even if the whole thing were to not continue to take off in the pod and internet sphere, it's at least so far already been an incredibly soft landing. And it feels really, really good that it feels like the ball is in our court. If it doesn't keep going, I can't sit around being a bitter old man at Sirius XM because we've got every opportunity to to keep it going. And and and, and I think it will. Uh, but if it doesn't, I, I've already got that. You actually grew up in New Jersey, but is it right you went to like a all boys school actually in New York City? That's right. So I went, I'm from a pretty small town in New Jersey called Rutherford, which is just outside of New York City. It's without traffic. There's, there's always traffic going into the Lincoln Tunnel, but without traffic, it's like less than a five minute drive. I'm really, really, you can see the skyline from my the corner of my parents' block. But in terms of geography, very close. In terms of society and culture, very, very far away. We did go into the city a bunch when I was a kid. My dad worked there. so uh, But there were a lot of other people, even in my small town, which, you know, the whole suburbs obviously exist because of New York and because so many people have jobs there. There was some legitimate fear of the big city in our small town, which, to be fair to my small town, may have been a little bit more warranted in the late 70s and the early 80s. Have you ever seen, like, The Warriors or anything like that? (laughs) You know, this is pre- Giuliani era. And I was in this small town and I was in a very small school within a small town. I wasn't in the public school. I was in the Catholic school. And I remember our teacher got a letter that she, I don't think she would have shared it with us if it had been a not Catholic school, but I think as a Catholic, she felt compelled to share it with us. But as a provincial parochial person felt compelled to shit on it because she just thought everybody, the best thing you could do in your life was to go to our little grammar school and then go to our little high school and then move maybe three doors down and stay there for the rest of your life. And that's fine. But she said, and I remember it clearly, it's one of the major turning points in my life. She said, so we got this letter from the school in New York. It's called Regis. It's really far away. So it would be a total pain in the ass to get there. It's really hard to get into. So none of you would get in there. And even if you did, you'd probably get stabbed on your way to school. Anyway, I've got the information if you want it. And there's really like two kinds of kids. Most kids are scared off by that. And then there's the small number of us who are like, that sounds what you're saying it's far away and I could get stabbed. So I, I took her up on it. And then that just, it ended up, I, I never really intended to go there. I first, I wanted to see what the inside of a big fancy New York City private school. And I mean, it lives up to the reputation. It's ludicrous. It's a couple blocks from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Very beautiful, old, like J.D. Salinger kind of New York, Upper East Side, old money. And first, I just wanted to see the inside of it. And my mom was always really good about anything that we could do that was an experience that was free. She was really good about doing. So she's like, yeah, let's get on the bus and let's go see this place. And we went and it was just, you kind of blown away by it. So then we go, well, I was, so you have to take a test and then pass an interview. And then it's all scholarship. Everyone who's ever gone there for over a hundred years has gotten a full scholarship. And so then it became, well, I wonder how I would do on that test. How hard is it? I don't know. I just want to find out. And then still no intention of going. And then I took the test and passed. And then it was still kind of a, I wouldn't accept the scholarship, but I wonder if I could get in. And then by the time I got in, that was already the third or fourth time that we'd gotten there and the routine of getting over there wasn't that crazy. The fact that my dad had commuted into New York my whole childhood was like, he was maybe a little less scared off by it than the other parents. And so, yeah. And so I pretty much became, I still to this day, like, I feel like a, I feel like it's inaccurate if I say I'm from New Jersey because my teen years were spent in New York and beyond. But I also feel like a dick if I say I'm from New York because that's what people from New Jersey who are ashamed of being from New Jersey say, you know. What did your friends think about it? Did they think you were kind of cool? You going down there? Remember, maybe I didn't have friends because that's a really good question. I can't remember anybody. I honestly can't remember anybody having an opinion about it. I had one friend that was older than me and he had recently moved to town. He happened to move around the corner. So he wasn't part of like, his family was interesting. His dad was like a, a hippie who dropped out of society and then went back to school and became like a lawyer in his late 30s. So they were definitely already coloring outside the lines. And I remember that little clan thought it was very cool. And I guess he was, I, I pretty quickly lost touch with my friends in, I mean, I still see him when I go back. It's like, if, if I happen to be home for Thanksgiving, I still have that thing where you go to the bar in town the night before Thanksgiving and everybody that you ever, you know, that the first girl you ever kissed is at the bar drinking Miller Lite too. I don't know. I don't remember anybody like resenting me for it. I don't remember anyone being super excited about it either. You have an open love for all things hard rock and Sunset Strip, whichever you want to put it in. You discuss it regularly on your podcast. When you and Mark McGrath talk about it on the show, you have such a fun time with it and you get it. 
which I think is awesome. But how was you exposed to it at the time? Was that early on or I was imagining it was not long before it was kind of becoming out of fashion? No, it wasn't. It wasn't. But you know what? It got as big as it got right before it ended. That was almost the life cycle of it was the overexposure and the fact that it was no longer like raw and dangerous and a, a thing that they'd send you to Bible camp if they caught you with a Motley Crue cassette under your mattress. Uh, the thing that got me was the Dr. Feelgood video by Motley Crue. And I was 12 years old, which is just about the right age to get that. And you know what was really cool about it is I had a friend who was pretty heavy into it. And he, it was funny. It was typical of the time. He had an older brother that was like two years older. So his room was all like Motley Crue. I'm trying to think of what other posters he would have had. Not Kiss, but like the lighter stuff. And then his brother's room was like the Metallica, the Slayer, the Megadeth. You know, he was just like a little bit more of a hardcore Hesher. So this kid though, as soon as I, because uh, I didn't even have MTV. My parents took cable away from me and my sister when we were children because they caught us watching Porky's for like the 18th time. And we were like four. So we didn't have cable the whole whole time that I was uh, the whole time that I was like a teenager. So I was over at his house and saw the Motley Crue video. And he was like, Oh, yeah, yeah, you, you got to know about this stuff. So he instructed me to go and buy I think 30 blank cassettes. And I gave him the cassettes. And then I came back like a week later. And he gave me like, it was cool, because it was just so much more than just here's a Motley Crue album, here's an Aerosmith album. He was already pretty deep into it. And I've never really thought about that until this moment, that probably the reason why I went so deep is because from the beginning, you know, a band that I talk about a lot that very few people but me recall fondly is Pretty Boy Floyd. They're sort of a, sort of sometimes referred to as the band that killed it, as the copy of the copy of the copy before you go, this one's a little off. These guys might not be all there. And to me, you know, I don't know if you heard me interview Howard Benson, who's this like really, really um, respected producer who, as he even said, the only reason why he went on to have the career he did is because he produced hair metal albums, but none of them were a hit. So by virtue of the fact that all he had produced were hair metal flops, he didn't have the stink of being one of the hair metal guys. So when he did POD and then My Chemical Romance, and he went on from there. But when I talked to him, all it, I was like, are you aware that there's like maybe 3,000 people in the world who still consider Leather Boys with Electric Toys by Pretty Boy Floyd to be like the perfect pop metal album? I mean, not one of like, like, and, and, and it has a lot to do with you, Howard Benson. Like the production on that album was insane for the time. If you put it up against even the Motley Crue stuff, it was, even though it was the most bubblegum disposable stuff, it was actually like way heavier. The guitars were way heavier than than most of the other lightweight bands, the wingers and stuff like that. So yeah, this guy, Mike, got me started and I was a huge like jock when I was a kid, but I had, I had broken my shoulder. The doctor told me that I couldn't play sports for like a whole calendar year, including football the following year. So that had been like where all my time went and I felt like I needed something to fill the time. So I want to say that I saw the Motley Crue video in October and by Christmas, I had asked my parents for a guitar and hair metal is a really, really great music. I was just talking with somebody about this on my Patreon who's thinking about picking up the guitar. It's the perfect music to love to want to play guitar because it is the simplest music. They're, they're literally baby beginner chords. It's all most hair metal guys even know how to play other than like a G or a C. So it's probably the reason why I stuck with music as well. If I had gotten into the Smiths right off the bat, I wouldn't have been able to play a single Smith song and I might have given up before I ever could. But I was pretty quickly able to play Dr. Feelgood. First thing I ever learned was the breakdown to Every Rose As It's Thorn. I could do the guitar pick hit which Brett does on just the GNC cards. I was like, <laughs> yes, it sounds just like it. But it sounds just like the record. Yeah. And I put those guys on such a pedestal, man. I used to always say I, I would buy the, the tabliature books. I remember buying a tabliature book, which for people that don't know, if you can't read music, it literally just writes out six lines of the six strings and puts a number that for, you know, so if it says two on six, well, you're on the second fret of the sixth string. You don't need to read music at all. And I can remember getting those and learning how to play stuff and saying, oh yeah, that, that sounds exactly like whatever they're playing. Like I couldn't actually, fathom that I had access to the same notes that Faster Pussycat had. I'm like, oh, this is great because now I sound like whatever magic they do. It didn't even cross my mind that Faster Pussycat was also using the 14th fret of the D string to play their riff. I know exactly what you mean. I know exactly yeah. what you mean. <laughs> I thought those guys were gods. Absolutely. Hey, Pretty Boy Floyd did pretty good in England. They've had a long career. Shut up. Yeah. Really? 
Because their second, I mean, I'm such a dork. The stuff that they put out after Leather Boys with Electric Toys is in some ways even better. There's like Tonight Belongs to the Young. There's a couple songs they did. It's so bad too, because from what I heard, they had their guitar player. He pretty much wrote all the songs. They kicked him out when they got the deal, because I don't think he was like as cute in the picture as the new guy that they had. Howard Benson said on my podcast that all of a sudden it came out that he was going to sue them because he owned all the songs. And so the label needed to pay them off. They thought that Howard Benson loved them so much that he would take out a second mortgage on his house to pay off the old songwriter, which he did not. I think the label did, which is one of the reasons the albums got the album got dumped because they thought these guys wrote songs. And not only were they horrendously cheesy and was their album called Leather Boys with Electric Toys, they were also plagiarists and they couldn't play live. There's lots of problems with Pretty Boy Floyd, but the album flopped. They didn't give up. Everybody else saw the hair, uh, the Nirvana writing on the wall. They did not. I think they got the guy back in. He just forgave them and came back and wrote more songs that are arguably even better than the ones that are on Leather Boys with Electric Toys. You know, I've spent some time around them like kind of recently, and it's still a tremendous thrill for me to be in the presence of Pretty Boy Floyd. Being from New Jersey, obviously trickster and skid row and was you like a metal edge hit parade guy then yes absolutely absolutely every single magazine i still go and buy old copies when i can find them i've done whole episodes of my podcast just flipping through circus magazine from 1981 i can't find the ones that i actually want which is like yeah rip metal edge yeah absolutely every single one i cut out all of the pictures and literally wallpapered my wall and ceiling with tiny every little picture that i saw of dangerous toys and trickster i like the singles. I was very happy that they came from, I I never understood why, again, see, there's the New York, New Jersey thing. The New York bands prided themselves on, like my my favorite, I'm trying to think of who I really liked that got signed out of New York. The New York scene was really pretty pathetic then because it still had this huge chip on its shoulder that we're New York, CBGBs, the Ramones. And you're like, yeah, dude, that was 15 years ago. Like, you know, and now you're talking about, you know, Talking Heads came out of there. Living Color came out of New York. But I mean, it's uh, probably owing just to the racial politics of the time. Like Living Color were in the hair metal scene, but you just like didn't really think of them as like, you'd never see pictures of them just like hanging out with their arm around, you know, some guy from Taiketo. And I don't know where those guys were. I mean, they were at music school is where they were. They were actually talented musicians. So there was this underground thing going on in New York. There's a band I still love. We kind of, my band was kind of tangentially tied to them called Champagne Suicide. Never got signed. These guys were incredibly vulgar, really dark, really heroiny. The songs were called like, I mean, they had a, a, actually a tremendous song called Date Rape Barbie. Like this is like hard, hardcore stuff. And then fucking three miles away in New Jersey, it's got to be Bon Jovi. It's got to be Trickster with the drummer who puts stuffed Muppets on his drums. And it's like, I don't understand why we need to be such pussies, you know? But they write good songs, man. They write good songs. <laughs> One in a million is okay. You've picked up guitar pretty soon after you got heavily into music. And how many bands were, were you in before you started the band with Brian Cullen? And he answered the ad of yours for 14-year-old guitarist tired of the bullshit. Jaded already? <laughs> oh, no, two, two, two. Yeah, well, because what happened was... And I was, yeah, I put an ad in the East Coast rocker that said 14 year old guitarist tired of the bullshit. And I was, I mean, I was definitely aping stuff. I'd seen other people, you know, say who were a little bit more experienced in the scene than I was obviously, but like, you know, I got, I I actually tried to start a band with the kid who got me into music and it was the easiest thing where I'm like, I have a guitar, you don't. So I'm the guitar player, you're the singer. And he was way more into making up band names and writing logos in a notebook than he was in actually doing stuff. And I was, I knew a friend who was a drummer and we'd go down to the rehearsal room in town, which was a really sketchy place for kids to be there. Definitely smelled like bong water all the time. It was called Weeby Jamming. I mean, we didn't even have gear. They'd have to rent us cymbals and all the cymbals were like half broken and stuff like that. But that's what I was just like, yeah, that's what you do. You get a guitar, you learn how to play and then you go play, right? And the other guy just wanted to make up band names and draw logos. And then I went and found uh, some guy uh, through a music classified. And he was like, yeah, man, I'm a singer. And he had his hair grown out and he'd come to my parents' basement. And I'd be like, here's this little tune I got. Here's this other little shitty tune. And he would just tell me what the name of the band was going to be and show me the logo that he drew. And I'm like, I'm, I want to play guys. Like I want to actually do this. So I just said, I'm, I'm tired of bullshit. I want to, I want to be in a band. I'm 14. I don't have, I'm wasting my life here. And the cool thing was that it's, it's insane because Brian and I, and two other guys, 
got this band and we played at a club. And I mean, I remember our first show, we were, I might've been 15 we, and I was the youngest by the, band, by the band, but we were really, really, really little. And, you know, they announced us like, isn't this adorable? And I'm proud to say that the video is still somewhere at the end. They were like, oh, fuck, those guys like actually learned some songs, did some tasteful covers. I believe one of them was wearing a dead boy shirt. I'm not sure where these children came from, you know, but that was my first show. That wasn't their first show. They had already been in a band that had played in a club or two in eighth grade. And two of them were taking it seriously. And the other two were just guys who wanted to draw logos all day. So like they were actually way ahead of me in terms of they were also tired of the bullshit and they were also looking for people who wanted to actually really play and write a halfway decent song. Where was Brian from? Was he kind of from your area? No, he was from like a half hour away from me. And this is before we had driver's licenses. So our parents used to, my parents would drive me because the whole band was up in one neck of the woods and I was down in Rutherford. So my parents would would drive me each way and they were always like super supportive of that. And you know, I don't know if I was 14 when we met and they were 15. Well, then it wasn't too long until one of them turned 17. That's my eager driver's license in New Jersey. And these guys were, in addition to being in school and being in a band, always had like a job at a video store or something. So these were the kind of guys who had already saved up to get like a really shitty used sports car when they turned 17. So they were ready to, they were more than happy as long as I kicked them gas money to to come and and use their, their car and, you know, flex their freedom. And what year would this be? 91? Yeah. So we're just, we're too late. I can definitely remember staying up late and seeing like the very first couple of times that they showed like Smells Like Teen Spirit on MTV and, um, and Alive by Pearl Jam and being like, yeah, okay. Like I I get it. I get it. This stuff's always been a little silly and these guys have sort of, it's like, you know, you're at home and you're, you have the lights off and you're singing into uh, a hairbrush into the mirror and then somebody turns the light on. That's what Nirvana did to hair metal. And you're like, oh, okay, I get it. I get it. So we really liked it and we never stopped listening to it. And I started trading tapes with people who were sending me random obscure stuff from, from LA and from Japan and stuff like that. But we definitely, we were never a hair metal band. Like pretty much instantly we were doing, we were trying to do what we liked and adapting it to the times. We just wanted to be anti-grunge. And I was really, really into when bands like, like Suede came along. They made like a really, really big impression on me of, I was like, okay, so like aesthetically, that's how you end up with silver leather pants and black open, you know, Morrissey, your arsenal kind of shirts. So we just were like, okay, so we still like rock stars, but it's not cool to be a rock star. So we are defining ourselves as anti-grunge, not hair metal. And so that ended up being something that was frankly pretty proto-emo. Did I read you a fans of the band Degeneration? Yeah, yeah, sure. I guess that's a few years later. It was, yeah. Yeah, I can literally remember a hair metal guy. I'll even tell you his name. His stage name was Sin D. Divine was telling me about Degeneration and he was trying and his band was called Six Sex and they stole their band name from Tiger Tales, obviously, but they spelled it S-I-K-K-S-E-X-X. Of course. Why didn't Tiger Tales think of that? And he was telling me about Degen and I and, and this was just to show you what hair metal was. And it's so weird because it wasn't gay. I would say if it was, but it really wasn't. I didn't judge the vast majority of those guys to be gay. He's like, have you heard about this band Degen? And one of my first questions was, is the singer good looking? Because like, what are we doing here? if you have an ugly singer. And I remember him saying, well, is Kurt Cobain good looking? As if to say, it's no longer important to be, to look like a hot chick, to be a singer in a hair metal band. That was his takeaway from Nirvana was now we can have some scruff. Strange thing is though, like Kurt Cobain is like super attractive. In his way. Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah, the first two Degeneration seven inches, A side and a B side are really, really, really good. In my opinion, he never really wrote. I'm baffled by the ongoing success, solo success of of Jesse Malin. I'm baffled by the success of a lot of people. So that doesn't mean a whole lot. But the four songs are so goddamn, so goddamn good. Great band, great band. You guys would all be like under 21 when you were playing shows. Did that ever cause any problem? Yeah, for sure. We played all ages clubs. Uh, New York was always, man, when I went to high school, we went to bars, not all bars, but you always knew in every neighborhood, I always knew a bar that I could go to that would either not ID or 
would take any fake ID. There was this one place in Times Square called Playland. It was a big arcade, but they sold fake IDs too, openly, pre-Giuliani. I remember one time somebody told me that they went to Florida and they went to a bar and they tried to pass the fake ID off. And the guy goes, oh, Playland. Like everybody, everybody had a Playland fake ID. You just told them the name of any college. I think I went to Oberlin because I actually thought it would be cool to go to Oberlin. And, and that was it. I can remember we would, one time we got drunk and went and like pr- kind of banged on the door at the Bond Street Cafe on Bond Street in the East Village. And we're just like, we're banned. Come on, man. Let us borrow some gear. We'll play. And we didn't get a show that night, but we did. We played Bond Street a couple times. Um, Yeah, there were definitely some places that were off limits, but we played in New York as much as we played in New Jersey. I was trying to figure out the name of your band. Did you go through quite a few name changes? Because I know you eventually settled on National Velvet, but was there a few before then? There were so many. Oh, God. So first we were Acid Brats, the first show we did, which is taken from a Bruce Springsteen lyric on his first album. And then it was Sylph which is like, uh, as nymphs are to the water, so are sylphs to the to the woods, S-Y-L-P-H. And then we were Velveteen for a quick second. And this is when we started getting involved with management and making demos. Uh, grownups were involved with us that we didn't know. And I remember we did something, we cut something somewhere and somebody gave us a tape of it and they wrote the Velvet Teens on it. And we were like, oh, we can't be Velveteen. That's gonna be problematic. So then it became National Velvet which would have been problematic if we'd ever actually gotten signed anywhere because there's a Canadian band, which I didn't know at the time, called National Bell. Did you do an album or how far did that actually go? We were the same band that kept breaking up and getting back together with a different name, but it was always the same for for a little bit. It was three of us, but then it was back to the four of us. And we were very like precocious. We were 14 year olds who were like, fuck this, let's get a gig. Like, I think we just kind of felt like we had gone as far as we were going to go and none of us were clever enough to figure out how you were actually supposed to grow a band. We just had this idea in mind. And honestly, it wasn't crazy for the time that you just kind of do shows and someday maybe somebody's in the crowd and they come backstage and they go, hey, man, I'm going to make you a million dollars. And when that didn't happen, we were like pretty satisfied with the product. We were like, this is when we started off when we were 14. We never said this, but I think it was just sort of understood. This is what we were trying to do. We've gotten there and nobody really seems to care. And you don't think in terms of, well, hey, man, if this doesn't work out, you're going to have to go to school. You're going to have to get a job, maybe a job you won't like. Maybe we should try to make it work. We're very, very idealistic and very you know pure and artistic about it. So we're like, yeah, I guess we're done. And then not that long after that, I guess, we're all still hanging around in the same area. The word gets out that there's this guy and he had some credits. He worked on a massive soundtrack that had just come out shortly before that and had some other assorted credits with people that had won some Grammys and stuff in the 70s and 80s. A guy with a pretty big reputation was starting a management company and somebody was opening this beautiful state-of-the-art music recording studio in Paramus, New Jersey, which is literally the town that Trickster is from. And it's right in between where Bry's from and where I'm from. And to promote this brand new studio and for this guy to launch his management company, I don't remember what the relationship between the two of them was. They were going to do a thing where for like 24 or 48 or 72 hours, they were going to let any band that wanted come into this beautiful studio and record, get one hour and record a live demo. And again, Again, kind of like me with the high school, it wasn't like, oh, let's go, man. We'll get the big management deal. It was, hey, we've never really gotten a recording that we love. Like we used to do, we did a couple of, when I say eight track, you probably know what I mean. It means something different to music than it does to music listeners where a home recorder, our earliest stuff, you can record four parts and that's it. There's a way that you can make a little bit more than that. But then the next level up to that is you can do eight parts like stereo drums, stereo bass, two guitars, a vocal, eight literal tracks of music. And at that point, albums were being done 24 track, maybe 48 track. The best we'd ever had was we used to go to this place in New York. It was called the Institute of Audio Research. And it was a place where people were learning to be music engineers. And so they needed guinea pig bands. And I used to actually skip like a half a day of high school uh, on Fridays to, to be able to go there. And we did it so many times that we were kind of producing our own stuff. And they'd have to come in and tell us, you guys can't 
You can't run the session. The students have to be running the session, but they would be reusing the tapes over and over. So they really weren't great sound quality. We had okay recordings, but we didn't have anything great. So we're like, let's just go and do this. So we'll have like a good recording of us playing. And it kind of was that thing where we're on one side of the glass. It's like a floor to ceiling live room and we're playing our song and we can see the adults, the grownups. We can see like the jaws dropping. And I literally remember one of them came over to the window while we were playing and like air guitar back at us. Just like, oh, you guys are kicking ass in there. So we're like, cool, like play harder, play better. We walked out and they interviewed us for the local, like the New York news. And the guy offered us a contract and we, he recommended a lawyer for us to use. And in general, I don't think it's a great idea to get your lawyer from the guy that you're negotiating. I don't think we signed a horrible deal, but I don't think we signed a great deal either. And then we still never took the steps to like build a following. We were still, nobody would have known about us. This is way before people would have had websites or anything like that. So we went straight to showcasing. And this guy was working with a couple of a r guys, one of the guys who had worked with Skid Row. He introduced us to Dave Snake Sabo. It was like the highlight of the whole thing. But we would do a show and he would say, well, Island Records is coming tonight or, or this label is coming tonight. And sometimes we'd shake hands with the a r guy. Sometimes we wouldn't. And then we did this big show at, it was at Don Hills, which was a really cool hot club at the time. And they, they closed it. It was a private show. It was like friends and family. And I'll never know how much record label was there. Cause you come out on stage and you know, it's all dark out there, but I was led to believe that there was like at least a half a dozen labels there. And we come out and it's early. Cause it was his private showcase. It was like six or seven at night. And I don't have video to prove it, but all of us felt like we, and they told us, they said, go out and play and then go back to the dressing room. And if anybody wants to talk to you, we'll bring them back and they'll say hi after the show. So we're like, great. And we went out there and we felt like we played the absolute show of our lives. It was like, we always kind of played up to like CBGB's was, it sucked, man. It was coasting on its reputation. I remember my experience with CBs was always, you couldn't hear yourself on stage and you'd get off and you'd go, man, I couldn't hear myself. And they'd go, oh, no way. Cause we could hear you perfectly out there. And you're like, well, that's worse. If I can't hear myself, you shouldn't be able to hear me. <laughs> if I'm buried in the mix, I need to be buried in the mix out there too, because you guys can hear every nook and cranny of what I'm screwing up that I can't hear. This was, it was a beautiful room. It was a beautiful sound system. We had all the time in the world to sound check. There were lights. Our manager, we had convinced him to give us a thousand dollars for band clothes. So we had our shiny silver leather pants and we were everything that we'd wanted to be when we met each other, we were. And we felt like we went out there and just played the best show of our entire lives. And we just like, we didn't have to, we, you know, played it cool on stage, but we didn't have to, we were like, we did it. We did it. This was our job. Our job was to go out and kill. And we just killed. And we're going to get a record deal now. This is awesome. This is yep, that's why we're doing this. And we went back to the dressing room and we just sat there and we sat there and we sat there. And finally, some guy came back and he's like, what are you guys still doing back here? And we're like, you guys told us the record label would come and see us. And he's like, oh, no, no. I mean, if they liked us, if they maybe it was like a Friday, they're like, oh, if they liked it, they'll call us on Monday. No, what do you No, Come on, guys, come out, come outside, have a soda. You know, and we we're like, Oh, and that was sort of the pinnacle of the thing. The manager guy like bought a studio space and then bought all the studio gear intact. And he's like, you're going to do an album. He signed one other band out of that thing. It was us and these other guys. And he's like, you're going to do an album at my place. And we're like, yeah, that sounds great. And then I remember the other band did theirs first. And we were listening to their basic tracks with them. And we're like, this doesn't sound very professional. And they're like, we know maybe he can fix it in the mix or something. It sound, and it became kind of clear that he hadn't really bought good equipment and his, his dreams exceeded his, his uh, budget. And then slowly but surely the A&R guys from blah, blah, blah records that were working for him went away and their interns were more doing their jobs. And the writing was just sort of on the wall that this wasn't going anywhere. And as I said, we'd already pretty much broken up before we met this guy. We were like, fuck it. And then again, the idealistic thing, we went and told him we were, we couldn't get out of the contract that we'd signed. So he said, well, our only choice then is to break up. And he kind of dared us. He's like, I know you guys, you love that. You can't walk away from this. It's not in you. And I was like, well, fucking watch me. So I remember I went in his office and I had to pee and I peed as loud as I possibly could so that he could sit there and just listen to me peeing in his office. And then we came out and we're like, bye. And then I didn't do anything with my life for several years because I was stuck in this sort of stalemate of where I had you know, on principle, quit music, but I didn't want to do anything else. 
So that was that. And is this at the point when you went back to university and ended up coming to Oxford over here in the UK? Yeah, pretty much. So after high school, I didn't go to college because I was focused on the band thing. Plus, I didn't want to go to college. Plus, I was probably technically an alcoholic and I had a cat to take care of. I had a lot going on. And I, right. So I was out of school for two years. And as the band thing dried up, I was like, okay, there's only one way for me to save face and that's to go back to school. So yeah, I went to a school called Fordham in New York and my third year, I mean, I really backdoored into Oxford. You were supposed to have some sort of grade point average GPA to be able to go to Oxford. I just applied for what I wanted to go to England because of like suede and Oasis and the auteurs, you know, that was pretty much. And I did, I saw the auteurs last show, actually. Apologies for my daughter. I just applied for, I don't know, it was like City College of London or something like that. And I just put a big asterisk on the top of my application. And I was like, I would also like to be considered for Oxford, even though I didn't have the grades for it. And then they, I got the thing, you've been accepted. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to London. I'm going to go, I'll probably never come back. I'll join a band. This will be great. And then I got a call from the office like two weeks later and they were like, uh, oh, we're just we're not sure. Are you going to London or are you going to Oxford? And I was like, Oh, Oxford. And so they're like, okay, cool. Great. Thanks. So that's, I mean, that's, I didn't get into Oxford. It was complete nonsense. So upon returning back to the U S did you have any plans on what to do on your return? Never had a plan in my, this is honestly right now. I'm not even joking. I'm 43 right now is the first time I've ever had a plan for my entire life. Well, I guess when I was 14, I had a plan. <laughs> So uh, no, I kind of vaguely still wanted to do music. No idea how to practically go about doing that. When I came back, I started waiting tables in New York. It was very important to me to stay in New York one way or another. So when I finished school, I shared an apartment with someone in the village and I waited tables to make my rent. And by then Brian Cullen happened to be living a couple blocks away. And this is right when Pro Tools started. So he and I just started working on stuff in his uh, apartment. And I kind of have a little album of janky recordings that we made there, which are very much more of like this stroke C. It was, it was actually really cool. Cause like I said, New York scene was a fucking joke. People had such an attitude about it and they were clowns. Guys who were like retreads of retreads of retreads of Kiss acting like they were a big deal because the Ramones came out of here. It was just pathetic. But right around 2000, the Strokes, Interpol, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Walkmen, like it was, it was happening. It was New York was finally like New York again, and I liked the music. It wasn't just it was cool that it was happening. I really, I, I responded to it, and I, and I was in the town, and it wasn't just in the city. It was very of the city. It felt really, really New York of that moment. So the music that I'd started writing after our band broke up, because I never stopped kind of tooling with stuff, just lent itself to doing that sort of thing. And we were doing that, and we. You know, we knew a couple guys who were sort of in the industry and we'd like float demos to them so that they could float demos to other people. But again, not taking any concrete steps whatsoever. It was my big thing to go and try to do like an open mic once a week. I mean, like just not doing anything that would, it would ever get anybody on earth anywhere in the music industry. Although Regina Spector actually got discovered out of that same open mic, but I am not Regina Spector. And yeah, and then the radio thing came along and here we are. So your friend Brian Cullen, who you'd been playing in a band with, previously he helped me make some connections on the west coast right brian's been on the east coast the whole time he got me uh well, he got me my first job in radio writing a thing for this guy carson daly this mtv vj guy and then he started working at sirius and he put me in touch with will pendarvis who got me a part-time job working in new york and then they moved will out to the west coast to open the sirius west coast facility and then will offered me a full-time job out here how was it for you relocating to hollywood and seeing all these iconic sunset strip venues and locations i really like it <laughs> the rainbow is really really cool i've had thanksgiving at the rainbow like three times it's really fun the food's actually good and it's amazing to me to see these old hair metal guys who like that is thanksgiving for them now going to the rainbow there's not a ton of it left obviously but there's there's more of it here than there is anywhere else yeah i that's been a huge perk for me <laughs> Have you crossed paths with any rock guys from back in the day? Because I know you've had Steel Panther and Brett Michaels on your show. Let me see. I got to tape a session with Tammy from Faster Pussycat one time. And he's to me, like, he's one of the least embarrassing of those guys. Like, he was cooler than the rest of them at the time. He never really had to change his thing. His thing was always sort of like a Lemmy of hair metal where he was in it, but not really of it. And even when, even when grunge was really big, I feel like Tammy, like Faster Pussycat had a song on their third album about Andrew Wood from Mother Love Bone. Like he got it before any of the rest of them. And he was like, yeah, your guys is, I respect your thing. That thing is cool. 
I'm this punk hair metal thing. And I've got to see Faster Pussycat a couple times in the last like 10 years. And I still really enjoy it. And like I said, I, what does it mean nowadays? You, you have been a part of this, like Bullet Boys. That's Mark and some guys who used to be in a bunch of other bands. So I, it's always fun for me when I meet the bands and I go, okay, who's this guy in Faster Pussycat? And I'm like, well, no, what are you really in? And he's like, oh, I'm in, I was in the Throbs. And I'm like, well, now I'm meeting someone from Faster Pussycat and someone from the Throbs. This is far, far, far better than if you were, you know, Greg Steele or, or Brett Muscat or Eric Stacy or, you know, whatever. Two for one. Yeah, this is this is incredible. I never thought I'd meet a throb when I was growing up in New Jersey to meet the throbs. Somebody hit me up like two days ago on Patreon because I put a whole bunch of throbs songs up on my uh, Spotify hair metal playlist. Like, that's one of the best hair metal albums and nobody's heard of it. Most of those bands had like two or three good songs. The throbs is like an album. It just took them 15 years to make it. It was the Chinese democracy of hair metal. So by the time it came out, it was already three years post grunge and there was a lot of lost money a lot of sunk costs for their uh for atlantic records on that you see don dawkin came in one time and recorded a session as i said the biggest thing the best thing by far that one of the greatest professional perks i've ever 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 had or will have was a few years ago sirius xm put on like a hair metal festival and of course i was able to get like super duper all access to that and i think i even did some like djing at that and i have a friend i've only made one friend since i've been in los angeles really and he's a guy who was leading a parallel life to me. He had his band that played on the strip and he's like a screenwriter now, but he wrote a book. People can still find it called mom wears my leather pants. And so he's like, he's just me of the West coast. And so I had a friend that I could bring to this thing. And we were just dorking out all day that it was like, oh, let's go be backstage for LA guns. And now, hey, there's Davey Vane. Let's go say hi to, and we were just walking around drinking beer. And then, you know, let's go get a snack. And the craft services were actually really, really good for some reason. And so like, we got like a craft beer and we're eating really good food. And hey, Phil Lewis, great show. Oh, thanks guys. You know, like it was, it was ludicrous. It was, it was the greatest dude. It was the kicks played. Uh, Angve Malmstein was there. It was it, Vince Neal's awful but other than that you just get to get to beat the traffic when vince comes on what's your connection with stevie rochelle did you guys hook up when he was managing veins of jenna yes that's exactly my connection so right so bam margera was all about veins of jenna even the veins of jenna thing was kind of cool because those guys you know i thought it was kind of a joke that they were just being an 80s hair metal band in 2005 but you know i interviewed them and i said what they were the real deal they're like from sweden i think and i love swedish hair metal shotgun messiah is another underrated classic of the genre particularly the, se the second album and i'm like what are you guys doing like where's this gonna go like do you think this is gonna be successful and they're like when we were growing up in sweden we told everybody we were gonna go be a hair metal band on the sunset strip and they laughed at us we are successful and i was like oh i'm such a dick i didn't i didn't get it at all and there's like this tiny little, like nothing left of people who are still living in that universe of the rainbow and stuff like that. And I know, like I, I hung out with them and I had dinner with them at the rainbow and Stevie, and I was never a huge tough guy. I, I like tough. Wreck of Pit Bridge is a really good song, but I wasn't like blown away to be meeting Stevie or anything like that. But he took off because he's like married with kids and I was still single at the time. So I stayed out with Veins of Jenna and had a few drinks. And I remember they took me back to some apartment that was like right, right, right off the strip. And it was so weird because it was there was like a mother or daughter there. And it was sort of like not clear exactly who was maybe available or or both. And the mother daughter like knew that I was a DJ on Sirius. So they asked me to sign the wall of their apartment. And I was like, you know. This is a very, this is a very sad place. This is a very sad scene. And I'm sad that this is happening and I got to go home, but this is also the closest I'm ever going to get and closer than I ever thought I was going to get to the stuff that I saw in Decline of the Western Civilization Part 2, because I bet you like six different guys who were in London at one point have also rented this apartment and it looks exactly the same as it did in 1986. So Veins of Jenna, I, 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 have, I have them to thank for that. My old band, we did a East Coast tour in the US with a band from Albany, The Erotics, my band Teenage Casket Company, and Stevie got whiff of it and says, oh, I want to do a metal sludge tour and tag veins of jenna onto that tour so we went out for like about 10 dates and we played at arlene's grocery in new york and bam came out to that show after that show he says oh, i want you to come to my house and where was he living like pennsylvania or something like that yeah castle yeah. bam yeah veins of jenna dropped off the tour and went and shot that video and we did the last couple of gigs on his own but yeah that was crazy we thought they were gonna tip the scale i know they got to play with poison and all that kind of stuff everybody who touched bam for a minute there got you know there's just you know him was an okay band and and i forget his name he was a lovely dude he was the nicest night i always expected i always expect swedish rock stars to be like really really uppity 
comedian dicks and they're always like the nicest, like have a seat, have a beer, like you want me to make you eggs kind of people, like really exceptionally nice. But like him was never going to get that big without Bam. He, he just had the Midas touch for a, a minute there. So it was fair to think that he might be able to do it for Veins of Janna. Yeah, I like Metal Sludge. I check Metal Sludge from time to time. It's, I mean, anybody who's telling stories about, you know, flyering wars between Tuff and Taz, there aren't too many people who care about that, but I do. <laughs> when did podcasting come into your life? Was there a particular one that inspired you? No. Uh, oh, okay. So there's a sports writer that I liked on ESPN named Bill Simmons. He's known as the sports guy. And he's kind of a kind of a cult hit guy for a minute and then grew into a mainstream thing. And I remember he started podcasting. And I mean, to be honest, I didn't really care for his podcast, but I liked his writing so much that I was like, oh, I'll continue listening to this. And honestly, it's the way that I feel about a lot of internet based entertainment these days. He clearly got a following with that. It was clearly much easier for him to do that than to write columns. Maybe he was burned out on writing columns and he was making so much money that he basically doesn't write anymore. He just, and he's this big podcasting phenomenon. And I liked his articles. I don't really love hearing him talking, but that's what, you know, inspired me to figure out what that section of iTunes was anyway. And then, I don't know, I listened to Mark Marin for a little while. I listened to one basketball writer named Zach Lowe has a show called The Low Post that I listened to pretty religiously. But other than that, I'm, I'm not much of a, I've sampled everybody's show, but. Was there any kind of inspiration behind your Tully show one then? Man, I'm so fortunate now. So many things that happened accidentally that ended up being such a graceful exit ramp off of Sirius. Like for example, it would have been really weird if I had still been in, in studio doing interviews with guests that Sirius booked for me in the beautiful Sirius studios. And then we got fired. And then the next week I just been like, Hey guys, it's cool. Now I'm talking to people on zoom. It's pretty much still the same thing. That would have been like a real clear, like, Oh boy, how the mighty have fallen. But I've been doing zoom interviews for a year. So it's not weird at all. That's just like a little thing that softened the transition. And when Sirius gave me the podcast, I just knew that there were certain people who were on show who were able to do an hour long weekend thing. And I was kind of like, well, he's doing it and he's doing it and he's doing it. Why not me? And so we used to be, the Jason Ellis show used to be on a music channel. But when we moved to a talk channel, that was like a thing that was happening with the guys who were on the shows on the talk channel. So I was like, can I do that too? And they're like, we do not care. Like, sure, who cares? Go ahead. And then at some point, somebody was like, if you feel like posting it as a podcast, we don't care. Basically, it was like, if you just deliver 51 minutes and 25 seconds of audio every week, we'll put it on the air. If you don't, we don't care. The big guys like Jason needed to negotiate for the right to have podcasts. People like me, it was benign neglect. They just didn't even care what I was doing. It never would have occurred to me to have the audacity to say, hey, I want to post this as a podcast too. Because if I'd asked, they would have said no. But the fact that they were like, everybody else who's got one of these dumb weekend shows nobody's listening to is also posting it as a podcast. So I don't see why you can't. And so again, when Sirius went away, instead of having to turn around three days later and go, look, guys, it's this brand new thing that I'm doing. Yay. Just this is even better than before. I had this thing that was an established thing that had listeners. And obviously going to only a podcast has been really good for my listenership because it used to be that quite a few people listen to it through Sirius. And now everybody who's still with us has followed us to the podcast realm. So it was an accident. They weren't doing me any favors that they were aware of. And I wasn't angling to do anything, but it just so turned out that I had this infrastructure in place and a show that existed and people who are already listening to it. And for that, I am extraordinarily grateful. There's been a couple of little fluky things that where I am right now could be very, very different if it hadn't been for those flukes. How did you and Mark McGrath get to know each other? That just through interviewing him at some point? Yeah, exactly. He came on he came on the Ellis show once or twice. And then I think when I started doing my show, my original conception for it was that I was going to have two guests every week. So I needed like a pretty deep well of people who could be available all at the same time. So I remember I taped my first two shows back to back. I was really nervous because I'd never, as much as I'd been on the air, I'd never done my own thing. And I did Nathan Fillion and Alan Tudyk together and directly into McGrath and Matt Eisman, who's a comic who hosts American Ninja Warrior out here. And it was just, I found Mark really easy to talk to. And as I said, I needed guests and I could get, Mark was was cool enough to come by. And it just sort of, at a certain point, you just start to notice other people. You're like, oh, I'm at 40 minutes. 
got to get this to 51.25. I don't really feel like I have a whole lot left to talk to them about. And with Mark, it was just like, so you go, okay, there's some, there's some chemistry here. And it turns out our musical sensibilities are very, very similar as well. It's great, man. I love it. You've worked on several books with Jason. Have you and Mark talked about perhaps doing a book about his career? No. Do you know what? It's, it, somebody suggested that to me recently. Right now, I'm so, so happy. So relieved and overjoyed to be able to say that I'm, I am like too busy. I have too many things going on. And then, and beyond the things that I'm doing, I have like the next tier. I always think of life as those people who used to spin plates on like, I don't know if you had Johnny Carson or anything like that over there where they'd have like that kind of spear looking thing and they'd spin a plate and it would be spinning. And then they would start a second one. And eventually this was what passed for entertainment when we were children, the guy who could spin 12 plates at the same time. And I always think of my life as spinning plates between family and you know, whatever. And it was very hard for me to get like three plates spinning and I've got like three of them spinning now. So now I already know what like the next three are and I've got to try to get those going at the same time. And I do actually feel like if Mark was interested in writing something, I think I know kind of how to toe the line between making it fun, making it self-effacing, making it revealing, but at the same time, not burning bridges with people that he's going to be seeing at county fairs for the rest of his life. So I have not spoken to him about it. I don't know if he would be interested, but it definitely does occur to me that there are very, very, very few things I look at and go, I'm the guy for that job. I feel pretty confident in saying that if Mark is ever to write a book, I am the guy for that job. Love it, man. Love it. I'll wrap things up because I, I know you're short on time, but I appreciate you talking to me and uh, congrats on everything that's happening. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, man. You take care. to send a big thank you out to Mike Tully for taking time out of his busy schedule to talk to me here on the Straight to Video podcast. I really did enjoy his stories and hopefully you guys did too. For more info, please dive in and listen to Mike's own podcast, The Tully Show, or find him co-hosting The Jason Ellis Show wherever you find your podcasts. Alternatively, you can follow him on Twitter simply at Tully or on Instagram at Tullywood. Thank you to all you lot for listening to this episode of the Straight to Video podcast. For all earlier episodes, please visit stvpod.com where you can also find links to Straight to Video music and videos and you can also pick up the new Straight to Video logo shirt too. For now though, thanks so much for listening and supporting the show. It really means a lot and I can't wait to speak to you all again soon.